I'm going to, well, the title I was given, Emergency Surgery, Just How Bad Are We? And I'm going to give you the answer in a moment. Um, the data for the talk is from this report, Knowing the Risk, which was published by NCPOD uh, in December last year. And to put it into context, uh, within surgery in the UK, there's up to 25,000 deaths post-operatively each year. And the vast majority of those, not surprisingly, occur in high-risk patients who make up about 10% of the total number of patients undergoing surgery. So if you're a high-risk patient, your risk of... Uh, <clears throat> dying post-operatively is in the order of 10 to 15 percent. And it's not just death, of course, because they're more likely to get complications, and as we know, that uh, consumes significant resources with critical care and so on. So that was one reason for doing the report. The, uh, the second one is the suggestion that the results in the UK, uh, shown in dark blue on this slide, uh, compared to the states uh, are not as good if you compare predicted against observed mortality. So that very briefly, the study was a prospective study of the data I'm going to present to you. I've teased out as much of, as possible of uh, emergency general surgery, but there are uh, something of a hodgepodge of patients in the study, um, both elective and emergency, low risk and high risk, uh, and so on. But you'll see as we go along that uh, I've largely given you the right data. Um, patients w uh, were identified by an anaesthetist during that single week in March. Uh, any patient over the age of 16 and having surgery with the exception of the uh, specialties shown on the bottom of the slide. And the anaesthetists also graded their risk. So out of the more than 19,000 patients who had surgery that week, three, over three and a half were considered high risk. And as a subset, which is the data I'm going to present to you, about a thousand, a third of those high-risk patients were then uh, randomly selected and were uh, reviewed case notes and everything else uh, by uh, the uh, NCPOD advisors who are recruited just for that study, um, <coughs> people who are appropriately trained either as surgeons or critical care and so on. Uh, not surprisingly, if we look at the risk the anaesthetists uh, gave them, the, um, it more or less matched the ASA grade. So by the time you got to ASA 5, they were all considered high risk. And the proportion of high risk patients increased with the urgency or acuity of surgery and with age. And uh, if in terms of mortality, I'm going to give you the outcome and then tell you why it might not be very good. Uh, for non-elective patients, uh, the mortality rate was 18.1% in high-risk patients. And within uh, the high-risk patients, uh, the mortality again increased if uh, you are having immediate surgery, urgent sur surgery, compared to elective surgery. So what factors influence this outcome? Uh, you won't like this slide. I was surprised uh, by the data. How many patients had preoperative consultant review? Well, only 50% that could be proven. Uh, around 13% definitely didn't, and because of poor note-keeping, which is a criticism in itself, uh, the uh, amber or the orange box uh, are a large portion of unknown patients. And allied to consultant review, how many patients had a management plan? Well, it was considered that a satisfactory plan was present in 200 of these high-risk patients, 
an unsatisfactory plan in, almost, in 14%, which is quite high. And <clears throat> if, in turn, bearing those two factors in mind, the advisors then assess the quality of preoperative assessment, you can see it was only considered good in less than 40%, adequate in 50% and poor or unacceptable in 10%. Now, clearly, high-risk patients have... 91% of them had some form of comorbidity, and we looked to see if there was any effort to optimise these prior to surgery. I know the difficulties, obviously, in acute patients of doing that, but in 60% of patients, there was no evidence in the case notes that the, uh, that, uh, <coughs> the clinicians tried to uh, <coughs> optimize the, uh, these comorbidities. And a significant number of patients, non-elective patients, had delay in investigation. Of course, delay in investigation equals delay in surgery. <coughs> <coughs> Another thing we looked at, uh, which you might be slightly surprised at, was preoperative location. The vast number of patients, vast majority, were either on an ordinary ward or an ordinary ward level uh, with a bit of monitoring of some sort. Almost nobody was on level t uh, received level two or level three care. Where that did occur, we we found extremely good evidence. Uh, that the quality of preoperative resuscitation was much better if uh, patients received level 2 or level 3 care and that mortality was reduced. In terms of preoperative fluids, 6.6% um, <clears throat> of the total uh, received either inadequate or excessive uh, intravenous fluids. These are uh, <clears throat> the group of high-risk patients as a whole. And you can see uh, that the mortality risk, if you had either inadequate or excessive rehydration, was uh, extremely high. And for patients who had uh, evidence of preoperative uh, hypovolemia, uh, mortality was uh, sorry. I've got a pointer. Uh, mortality was again very high at 30 percent. And in terms of correction of the hypovolemia, uh, where this was inadequate, 55 percent of patients died, and it was inadequate in 30 percent. Nearly a third of patients who were hypovolemic if they didn't go to a critical care bed preoperatively. Uh, what happens during the operation? Again, intraoperative fluid management wasn't fantastic. 10% still, or almost 10% still had poor, were considered to have poor fluid management <coughs> with a significant meet, uh, number not meeting the uh, gift us up guidelines that have been discussed and debated at this conference previously. Similarly, with monitoring, bearing in mind these are all high-risk patients, only 5% had any form of cardiac output uh, monitoring. And if monitoring was uh, considered by the advisors to be inadequate, there was a threefold increase in mortality. The last thing to look at is post-operative care, uh, location of post-operative care. Uh, <clears throat> Nearly 10% or approaching 10% of patients, the advisors thought, went to the wrong location postoperatively. And if they did go to the wrong location postoperatively, mortality rates were 20% or 1 in 5. And clearly this supports either the greater use or perhaps greater provision of critical care beds. So looking specifically at the deaths without critical care, 208 deaths in the high-risk patients altogether, 80% <coughs> of those uh, didn't get, or 79% didn't go to critical care. Um, 
and the majority were 69% on the bottom line were patients having immediate or emergency surgery who were considered high risk. The final assessment that the advisors did was uh, how good was the clinical practice overall. You can see the guidelines there, room for improvement clinically, organizationally, both or less than satisfactory. And only 40% of non-elective uh, surgery was con uh, were the patients considered to have had satisfactory or good care. And you can see that there was room for improvement in, uh, in the remainder, uh, a lot of them being room for improvement clinically. The final fact to give you is about CPOD theatres. As you, uh, <coughs> the mere fact that they're called CPOD theatres reflects NCPOD's drive to uh, uh, persuade hospitals to have these over the years. And since that first started uh, in the 90s, we got up to 87% of hospitals having uh, CPOD, daytime CPOD theatres in 2009. This seems to have reduced uh, over the last uh, two years. Every hospital in the UK got an organisational questionnaire um, and they generally answer them, so it's down to just over 70% now. So the key findings, 20% of patients overall are high risk, very poor uptake of uh, cardiac output monitoring, 80% uh, of high risk patients went back to an ordinary ward post-operatively and 10% of those died. Um, 80% of deaths were in the high-risk group, half of whom didn't go to critical care at all. Fluid management was poor, and overall standard of care was not good. So that's how bad we are.